Okay, so um, the, the the point of t tonight's Let's Talk Rules is to look at Rules 22 and 23. So this is the referee core and uh, the procedures and the first referee. Uh, and the reason why I split it up between first and second referee is that the second referee, there's a bit there's a bit more to talk about. Um, and therefore, I didn't want to do first and second together because um, that would be a really long session. So I'm hoping that this one will be relatively uh, sh a little bit shorter than the, so some of them that have gone before. OK, so. Um, we're going to look at rule uh, 22 and 23, um, the referee core and their composition and the pr procedures. And then we'll look at the first referee um, and some of the comments which are made in the guidelines uh, around the first referee. Um, we will look at the rule text and the guidelines in the case book. There are some interesting points in the case book which are worth noting. Um, there are fewer video situations in this one um, just because we've looked at most of the relevant ones and I don't want to repeat um, a lot of the stuff that we've gone before, particularly when we come to the um, or authority and responsibilities of the first referee. So the refereeing core. Now, this is just to remember that you are one team. OK, so this is this is uh, just one match, one team, one match from the 2014 Women's World Championships in Trieste. Um, and we have the entire um, <coughs> team uh, in this photograph. Um, and as you can see, um, we've got um, five line judges, uh, three scorers and three referees, and they make up the um, uh, the refereeing call for the match. And it's important that, that I put this in is th to show the sort of uh, the, the 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 gel and the camaraderie of the of the teams, because it's really important that um, you work all together um, when you're when you're a match and you're all really working as as one. Um, so the refereeing core, the composition of the refereeing core for the, for a match is is exactly what that photograph um, showed. It's your first referee, second referee, the scorer, um, assistant scorer if you're there, uh, reserve scorer if there is one, um, four um, line judges or however many line judges you have, um, including maybe a reserve line judge. Um, and if you're lucky enough, you might have a reserve referee as well. So um, it's quite a big core. Um, it's noticeable that within the VNL, um, obviously there are no line judges there, um, but there are two scorers. Um, and um, I suspect that um, the days of four line judges are, are fast receding, that um, we will move away from um, having four line judges. And, and particularly in world competition, I would be, wouldn't be surprised if there weren't any line judges at all. Uh, in future competitions. Um, so um, it, I, I can't see that happening in in, in the um, uh, yet where, where you haven't got challenge or, or supporting tools unless uh, the, the unless the teams obviously um, absolutely understand that um, we're fallible and we don't see everything. Um, and therefore um, there is absolutely no point um, uh, querying things and I think that's one of the points from the VNL is the the players have just got on with it um, and there's no moppers either at the, this VNL um, and therefore um, and and the number of delays to clean the floor have been few and far between um, it's amazing how when you take away something um, the players just get on with it um, so at the moment the refereeing core is composed of, of these members and it's and it's important that uh, the team works together. So um, you, you've got uh, your your pre-match preparation. Um, so as referees, if I just focus on the the, the referees, and uh, we've got a, a, a photograph here actually from um, the under twenty one world champ junior world championships in um, Bahrain um, here, where the three referees are are checking the balls together, and this is this is a good point that you, you do things together so that um, uh, you support each other. Um, so before the match, as a team, make sure that you go through your same procedures. You check your teams against the roster. You check your teams against the score sheet. You check the equipment. Somebody's always keeping time and and, and reminding where you are on time. Um, you know the protocol and where you need to be in the protocol. Um, and also making sure that your team is briefed. 
Um, and then during the during the match, um, the, the, you're there to ensure you know where the match balls are um, at all the times. Um, decision making about working as a team, making sure that you understand the decisions that's been made um, and what is um, what the outcome of that decision making is. That managing the interruptions as a team. So f- even if you're the first referee um, and your second referee is working hard at interruptions to, to manage them, then you need to be aware of what's going on all the time um, and know to look for um, something that may happen out of the out of the ordinary at an interruption. And then afterwards, uh, you've got to check all the administration is completed and check the score sheet. Um, uh, and then you remain a team until you actually leave till you actually leave the venue uh, and then your your duties are, um, are are done so it's it's a point of as soon as you arrive you're part of a team and you leave you're part of the team so in terms of the procedures so the, the rules the rules you might it might sound obvious um, but the rules then go on to say that um, only the first and second referees may blow a whistle during the match it may seem obvious but um but but it's it's important to 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 make sure that um, all referees understand that um, blowing the whistle is is a really important part of your duties, um, and it's as much as how you blow the whistle as to when you blow the whistle um, that is important. So the, the obvious times when when it's the case is that obviously the first referee gives a signal with the authorization for service um, that begins the rally. And then either the first or second referee will signal the end of the rally, uh, providing that they are sure um, that a fault has been committed and they have identified its nature. And it's it's really important to know what fault you have identified or what play you have identified as the end of the rally and ensure that you make the decision that is corresponding to that play. So um, the, the number of times that you may see um, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the attacking player hits the ball into the net uh, on the third hit, team hit, and the ball rebounds out of the net and hits another team player. Um, and then the number of times you see ball um, ball in shown on that play rather than four contacts or two contacts if it's gone back to the attacker. It's just about making sure that you know exactly what the fault is and, and, and showing that. And it gives the players confidence that you are um, making sure that you've got the right um, the right fault. Um, and also you can blow the whistle when the ball is out of play to indicate the, uh, an authorization or reject in actual fact a team request. Uh, and therefore you use the whistle in different ways. Um, when, you, when you're in a, a, a match situation where the, the authorization for service the end of rally, the tone and the length of your whistle is roughly the same for every single rally. It should be consistent throughout the, the same pitch um, uh, and tone. But then you can uh, you can use different lengths and different types of whistles to get players attention, for example, on the court. Or um, if you need to uh, uh, stop play because it's something dangerous has happened, like a ball has run onto the court, then you may use a different type of you may use your whistle in a different way to make sure that the players go, oh, that's different, um, and they take notice of what you're trying to, to do. Um, so you wouldn't use the same tone that you authorise and whistle faults with for, say, um, trying to get the teams to change in, from position two or four when they're warming up, if you're if you're managing the warm up, um, you'd use a, a completely different, and, and, and it, it makes um, it, the players will understand when it's important and when it's, when it's something to, to, to pay attention to. And you've got to be aware that if the sports hall is loud, then you need to whistle louder. Um, and that can take a lot of effort, um, but particularly if you've got to do it over five sets um, of volleyball. So, you know, you could be blowing the whistle um, at somewhere in the region of 500 times. If you went in, in, a, in a five set match, you could be up to that um, sort of number. So. Um, at the end of it, you're going to you're, you're going to be quite drained, um, particularly if you have to use a lot of effort. Um, so the, the the procedures go on to talk about and say that after the referee's whistle to complete uh, the show, the completion of a rally, um, you have to indicate with the official hand signals and make sure that you use the the, the official hand signals. Um, so 
if the fault is whistled by the first referee, then the order is the team to serve the nature of the fault and the player at fault if necessary. And sometimes it's it, it, it's good to indicate the player just so that everyone is aware which of the players um, you have uh, you have called the fault against, particularly if it may not be clear. So the first referee, remember, team to serve, then the nature of the fault and the player if necessary. So when you get to the second referee, the second referee will indicate the nature of the fault first, uh, rather than um, uh, the um, uh, the team to serve. So it's a different order. The nature of the fault first, the player at fault if necessary, for example. Um, it's not it's not necessary, for example, if you've whistled a, a net contact or a, a penetration um, to to indicate the player. Um, certainly um, you, you don't have to, you know, somebody touched the net. Doesn't doesn't really matter. You know, you've seen it, you've whistled it. You don't have to indicate the player all the time. Um, because players will then start going, well, was it me? Was it them? You know, and, and then you get a, 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 some to them, to them back. So you, you don't need to do that. Um, and then the team to serve following the hand signal of the first referee. And, and in this case, um, the first referee doesn't show the fault. So um, the key point for the second referee here is to be on the right side of the court when you indicate the fault. So, for example, if it's a net contact, that's generally because your responsibility is on the receiving team, then you're on that side of the court already. So you don't have to move. But if it's, for example, um, uh, the ball into the antenna, then it, then you have to make a decision. Is it a ball into the antenna off the block and therefore you're on the right side of the court or is it off the attack and therefore you're on the wrong side of the court and therefore if you are going to, as soon as you see the ball go into the antenna, you're going to whistle because the ball is out. But then you need to give the first referee that information as to which team is at fault. And you do that by going to the right side of the court before you signal the nature of the fault. So you're going to give the signal of out, but you need to do it for the, the, the right side of the court at that point. Otherwise, the first referee is going to give the service or throw the service to the wrong team. So it's just one of those ones where you have to think a moment, move to the right side, then give 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 the out signal. And then the first referee will know, OK, because you are on this side of the court, then the ball must be this side or this side. Um, and that's just a real uh, key one. And the first as first referees, uh, and we get onto this in terms of in terms of first referees, you must give the second referee the time to do that. You can see the fault. It's not one that you can that you should whistle. If it's something the second referee should whistle, give them time. Let them whistle it. Let them get into the right position before you make any decision. Um, it's about allowing your team to do do their their responsibility, their authority on the court. Um, and and just remember, the first referee doesn't show doesn't show the nature of the fault um, or the or the player at fault. Only the team to serve, and the second referee will then. Um, follow the first referee's um, uh, signal. And this is the point at which, you know, if you are on the wrong side, you have to then admit to the first referee, look, hang on a minute, we've got this wrong, it's the other way, and you're going to have to change your mind. Can I ask a question, uh, Nick? Go, yeah, going carry on. back to what you were talking about a few minutes ago, you know, about the different tones of whistles and things, which it's fine when we were blowing them. The, what did people find at the weekend when they were doing the under 15s with the little electronic thing? Because try as I might, I only seem to get one sound out of the damn thing. <laughs> you know, it, it peeps and you know, you can either hold it and try and get a longer peep, which we're not supposed to do, but you can't get the old little toot like you used to. Yeah, yeah. You know, with a different uh, sort of pitch of, hey, don't do that, as opposed to the stop it now sort of thing. Did anyone uh, get any find that at the weekend? Die. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't um, yeah. caught side all the time, but I don't, there didn't seem to be any problems, but we were refereeing juniors, so. Yeah. No, I was just curious about whether people actually managed to get any sort of different tone, for want of a better word, out of their whistle, their electronic whistle, when it's a press a button and it's, you know, it's outside our control. Yeah, that, that is, that is a different, a different thing that, with the, with the electronic whistle, you, you'd expect it to give you the same every time, so therefore, 
Um, I suppose the only thing you have got with the electronic whistle is that it's a little bit more directional um, and therefore you, you you sort of point it in the direction of the player that you um, uh, uh, <laughs> maybe may, maybe that's one way of, of of getting a different a different response out of it. But um, yeah, interesting point. And, uh, and until I've used an electronic whistle in a match, I won't know. Um, but I haven't yet, so um, we, we can um, that be one to, to to look out for. Okay, thanks. Okay, so. Um, Carrying on from that, then um, in the case of an attack hit fault or a blocking fault by back row or libero players, both referees indicate according to those two cases above. But also if you have a double fault occur and it doesn't happen very often and thankfully it doesn't happen very often, um, then um, both referees have got to indicate the nature of the fault and the players. And then the first referee has to make a decision between the two as to which of the faults is um, um, it, it is is one of the faults going to over over trump the other one? Um, is it simultaneous, um, etc.? Um, and therefore, the referees must communicate effectively in this way. Uh, and I'll give you an example of this. Um, uh, for example, uh, server steps on the end line, um, and the uh, receiving team are out of position. So both whistles are going to be pretty much together. So the first referee is going to be pointing to the end line, perhaps not even looking at the second referee. And the second referee is going to be happily um, showing that the team is out of position and indicating the player. Um, and therefore, it's only after um, uh, a few moments that both referees will realise that um, the other has signalled a fault at the same time. Um, and therefore, you, in this instance, you need to um, refer back to obviously rule 12 um, in this case, and uh, you would know that uh, a fault of the service execution um, uh, always takes place uh, precedent over a positional fault of the receiving team. So in that case, the first referee will determine that the, that the uh, server stepping on the end line um, is the fault, and therefore the receiving team, even though they're out of position, will serve next but the referees must communicate effectively and be able to determine these situations um, and, and deal with them and without having a long discussion about it as well. Um, obviously, in, in international volleyball, the, the referees are mic'd, so therefore they should be able to communicate with that and, uh, and, and get that done without um, uh, anybody noting um, uh, you know, pretty quickly and without anybody seeing any discussion at all. Um, but obviously, if you're on um, in 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 the MVL, you'll need to have a quick chat together uh, and not take too long over it as to what's going on. But make sure um, that everyone knows what's happened. Okay, so uh, the the guidelines go on to stress um, the fact that the the teams must be informed of exactly the nature of the fault whistled by the referees, and and this also. Um, it's for anybody watching as well, um, so that they know what's going on and therefore use of the official hand signals is really important. Um, there are obviously some situations whereby there is no official hand signal and therefore uh, the, the, everyone that's um, not close to the, uh, to the action may be none the wiser. Um, so, for example, um, interference um, is, is one where there is no, um, no hand signal. Uh, but in this case, you um, you just have to indicate the player and be clear to the teams and explain if you have to. Um, and and the guidelines actually go on to say that um, that that they should only be the official uh, hand signals and not local ones. Um, uh, just to to clarify um, uh, for for better understanding, um, there are some that, that that creep into the game. Um, uh, next server is one, uh, which is not official. But most most players um, and, and referees know exactly um, what um, is being requested um, with the, with the, this hand signal. Um, but it's um, it's one that um, is not official, and therefore you you wouldn't um, you wouldn't use it if you if you. Um... So once once you've got um, once you you're you're effective at, at uh, signaling the nature of the fault, then um, the the. Guidelines go on to talk about the speeding up of the game and the, the fact that the game is much faster now than it ever used to be, um, particularly 
particularly in, in well, women's volleyball is, is speeding up, but men's volleyball has got very quick indeed. Um, and therefore, um, the, the, the referees must work together with the line judges uh, that you, and the scorer um, to, to be clear as to um, what is going on and everyone knows what's happened because it could just be that you're distracted just for a, a split second and you miss something. Um, so therefore, if you need to, um, uh, you need to look at each other a lot, um, particularly um, uh, if it's if it's noisy as well, because you won't be able to. Uh, you can only look at use eye contact and and hand gestures. Um, and and Deborah Smart and I always refer back to a to a batch we did in Shetland back in two thousand and five in the Island Games. Um, Orkney versus Shetland. It was. It wasn't a high level match. It was a. It was the eleventh uh, and twelfth place teams, uh, but it was five sets um, and. Um, all the crowd turned up with metal pots and pans and they bashed them with wooden spoons for two and a half hours almost non-stop um, and throughout um, Deb and I could only communicate with um, our eyes and um, uh, and we had to make sure that we looked at each other all the time because we couldn't hear e each other's whistle either um, it was just so noisy and there was another match going on in the hall at the same time, which was also a, a semi-final. So it's it's very important to um, that that you ha you have that um, uh, connection um, and avoid being seen disagreeing with your colleague's decision. You know, um, coaches are very good at this. Um, they're very good at um, trying to get the second referee to admit that they didn't believe the first referee's decision and things like that. So um, uh, even if you're not even if you you're not sure about it then uh, you don't give them don't give the impression that um, uh, you disagree with what the first referee has decided um, if it's a point of the rules and it's clearly wrong um, then as a second referee you can go and talk to the first referee and say look you know the uh, I, the decision and, and get the decision clarified so that you don't get a protest or, or something like that but in general if it's something like uh, handling or anything like that then absolutely do not um, uh, be seen to um, to be disagreeing uh, and keep it consistent if you can. Um, so we move on to the first referee and the first referee, it says, carries out his or her function standing on the referee stand um, uh, at the end of the net opposite the side of the scorer. Uh, simple enough. And his or her view must be approximately 50 percent, 50 centimetres, sorry, above the net. And I put these two photographs in because uh, one thing you'll notice is um, that both referees, one of which obviously is me, um, we are significantly higher than 50 centimetres above the net here. OK, and the reason that this is is because this was um, this is under 21 men um, and senior men is very much the same, particularly in the international game. Um, the ball contact is taking place at um, around the three metre mark and, and above. Um, and therefore being um, uh, 50, 50 centimetres is what, 2 290. Um, so um, uh, you need to be that little bit um, higher um, in, 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 the, in the men's. Um, and also, um, the, the, if you're in the luxurious position of having an adjustable stand that you can move up and down, um, then, um, then make sure you're comfortable with the height at which, um, which you choose to, what, to, to view the game at and that you don't appear to be far too high or too low. Um, it is noticeable when that if, if you have got a, a stand uh, and the referee is too low and you're having to look up and look down and you're moving, you're having to move your head up and down um, just to see the difference in the in the ball contact that's going on. Um, so if you have got the, uh, an adjustable stand, then you'll know where that roughly where that base has got to be. So um, for me, I know that um, the base is about 10 centimetres below um, the bottom of the net. So I know exactly where I need to put the stand um, for what for the for the height that I, I particularly want um, the game. Um, but as I say, in men's, you tend to be higher um, than 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 you need to be in women's uh, game. Um, 
So the, the first referee directs the match from the start and to the end. And this is the, the, the first referee really is the, the one in control. So the first referee is the is, is the one that's got to make sure the protocol is fine. Make sure all the stuff is done before the before the start. Um, when you're on the stand, you are directing uh, the entertainment, shall we say. Um, it, it, the the way the match goes is going to be down to you. Um, OK, you can be thrown some curveballs by the odd line judge or um, uh, or even your second referee, if you uh, um, if you will. But um, the, the general point is that the first referee has authority over all members of the core and the members of the teams and their decisions in the match are final. Um, and you're authorised to overrule the decisions of other members of the refereeing corps if it is noticed they are mistaken. Um, so um, even if your line judge um, is absolutely certain they've seen a touch uh, and you don't believe it, then you're well within your rights to overrule them as you will with ball in and out. Um, and um, but you can only uh, overrule on stuff that you are sure about. So uh, no, 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 um, no taking the, the 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 word of the teams on that one, even if uh, even if you um, are are found to be incorrect. Um, and, and they have the authority to to replace a member of the refereeing corps who's not performing his functions properly. Um, one of the the referees at um, London 2012, uh, Franz Lederis, a very very um, experienced uh, referee from Holland, did a, a number of um, uh, very, very important matches. And one of those was the World League final in Serbia, in Belgrade, um, around um, 2011. Um, and um, he said that uh, at one point there was a, um, a, 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 a block touch that wasn't seen by the line judge. Um, and it caused a, a, a lot of problems, um, both uh, court side on the pit, on the, during the match. Um, and um, uh, at one point, uh, Franz said, well, I, I didn't replace the line judge, but I know the line judge had been replaced because at one point I looked at him and the next time I looked, it was a her. So <laughs> he knew that the line judge had been replaced, but he didn't have he didn't uh, replace the line judge. The, the jury had replaced the line judge um, during a during a stoppage in play and he hadn't noticed. And it was only when he went round his team again um, for the next uh, the next point that he actually find that the line judge was was completely different to the one that he was expecting to see when he looked at that position um but uh, it's not normal that you would that, that you see um line judge replaced but if they are clearly not doing their job they're clearly not competent in the job then you have to you'll have to either make a decision of replace them or not use them at all and if that means that you have to lose a, a competent one on one side of the net because you've got an, a less competent one on the other side, then um, so be it. You just go right from now on. I'm not using my line judges um, and just and just say that's it. I, I can't do it, it, particularly if the line judge is being clearly uh, favouring maybe the home side. Um, so the first referee obviously controls the work. It says here controls the work of the ball retrievers, floor moppers and wipers and things. Um, less so important now, but obviously the first referee does authorise the teams actually to to, to mop the floor, um, and, but also um, controls that in terms of um, not allowing um, too much time to be taken on it. Uh, and ball retrievers, it's just about knowing where the match ball is. Uh, and, and if you've got five ball system or three ball system or what, or even just one ball, um, just knowing where are the balls? Who's got the balls now? You'll have noticed in the VNL, if you have seen any of the VNL, is that um, they are using, um, uh, I, I don't know, I suspect 24 balls um, because they are put in the ball cart and the ball cart is put at the back of the service zone and the player goes to the ball cart, pulls a ball out and serves with it. Now, uh, in my mind, that's an excellent way uh, of getting rid of ball retrievers and all they have to do then is, is just fill the ball cart up each time. I, I doubt whether they're using maybe 24 balls, but they might be using 12 in the match just to make sure there are enough balls in each ball cart at any one time. Um, and, and I think that that's perhaps one of the things that might uh, change going forwards. Um, the next one is uh, you have the power to decide on any matters involving the game, including those not provided for in the rules. Um, uh, there's there's obviously an excellent rule 
which we'll see in a minute, which is 23.2.3, which we call the golden rule. And the golden rule is that the first referee has the right to decide on any matters that are not covered by the rules. So um, so you make the decision, uh, you tell the teams what it is and, and play continues. It's the, it's the one that helps you out. Um, and also that you wouldn't um, uh, have um, any permission, uh, any any uh, discussion about um, decisions. Um, you just need to uh, keep it very brief. Um, use the wording of the rules um, and don't allow um, discussion. Um, particularly, um, particularly when you when you have um, captains that like to discuss lots of points, you need to be able to tell them, look, captain, you know, you're 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 wasting time. Um, and you can either use the time delay or you can um, you can use the warning if you think that they are persistent in their um, questioning. Um, once you've given an answer using the rules, then then you say, well, that's it. End of discussion. Uh, you need to move on. Um, so. Um, one moment. Um, here is um, here is our rule um, about. Um, uh, twenty-two point uh, two point three, twenty-three point two point three. Um, he, she has the power to decide on any matters involved in the game, including those not provided the rules. So that, that's the real key one um, that um, that you can um, you can use that will help you out um, in in those situations where you have to be um, you have to think a bit more broadly to get the um, get the right result. Um, but if the um, game captain wishes to um, give an explanation, ask for an explanation, then then they can ask the question. Um, and you, all you need to do is to give them an explanation of the application or interpretation of the rules um, uh, of which you base the decision and use the technical language which is used in the rules and, and don't permit a discussion with the captain as to whether they think that um, uh, that you have applied it correctly or not. OK, but if the game captain clearly doesn't agree with you and it is a case of um, um, application of the rules um, and, and interpretation, then they can protest if they so wish. Um, and they have to say so at the time. Um, and um, uh, you would you would note that the protest have been made at a particular point in time. Um, and then after the match, they have the right to write their protest on the score sheet. Um, they would um, dictate it actually to the scorer. Um, you don't, uh, you wouldn't allow um, uh, the, the the captain to um, to write on the score sheet themselves. They can dictate their protest. Um, uh, and the first referee must allow um, authorize the, the right of the game captain to to have a protest. Uh, I don't think it happens very often, um, but it has to be a clearly uh, a clear um, misunderstanding. Uh, of the rules and the application of them for a protest to succeed. Um, and just to remember also, the first referee is responsible for determining before and during the match whether the playing area equipment and conditions meet the playing requirements. So if they don't, then you have to get them changed. Um, remembering that the captain at any stage can ask you for a check of the equipment. Um, which you must allow the captain to um, to do. So, for example, if the captain says, look, the, this match ball, I think, is losing pressure, then no discussion about whether it is or is not losing pressure. Just change it for the next, for the for the other match ball and get on with the game. Um, but, but if it happens a lot, then you might have to say, no, look, come on, um, we need to um, we need to move on from this after having obviously checked that the ball is the right pressure. But in those situations, move the game on. Uh, and the captain will obviously uh, feel a bit better if you said, right, fine, uh, we'll, we'll change the ball. Let's just change it and, and move on. And um, so in terms of first referee's responsibilities prior to the match, um, you inspect the conditions of the playing area, making sure that it's safe. Um, you check the balls and the other equipment. You perform the toss with the team captains and control the team's warming up. And we went through a pre-match routine um, uh, earlier on in one of the very first um, Let's Talk Rules sessions. So but that's why I've not sort of replicated that here. Um, and but your your pre-match routine should be well rehearsed. You've got um, you know that you've got 30 minutes um, from the moment at which the warming up starts and, and everything. It should be ready to go. So that 30 minutes, you've got some set things in your mind which you know you have to do. 
uh, and therefore you just go through that process every single time. So what's the first thing I do once I once I can get going? Um, uh, so um, and and you would work with the with the second referee. So in this case, we've got the first referee. The second referee is measuring the height of the net, and the first referee is is managing that situation. So the first referee is the, is the referee without um, the the pole, the the, the net height measure, um, because they are confirming um, the the height of the the net. And this is the same with the with the team rosters and and all those sorts of things. Um, so those things you do it together um, so that you're checking all the time. Um, numbers very important that you check numbers of players against the roster against the score sheet. Um, make sure they don't change. So even though you might have checked it um, when they're warming up, generally when the official warm up starts over the net, then it's time to check it again just to make sure that you have the right players, the right numbers, because it can look very silly if things are found out later in the match. And it's just down to the fact that you just didn't go down the roster to, to look at it. Um, and then during the match, um, the first referee is authorised to issue warnings to the teams and to sanction misconduct and delays. Um, and it's important that the first referee is the only one that can apply misconduct and delay sanctions. But all the other officials, line judges and second referee and scorer can report information to the first referee um, and inform them of facts of, of things that have happened. And the first referee should uh, take action based on um, on what they're told. Um, it's in really, really important that the first referee protects other members of the referee corps. So if you've got line judges and the line judge gives the ball out, and the players start having a go at the line judge, you must protect the line judge. Um, they are a member of your refereeing corps. You cannot um, just leave them there. So in those situations, you, it's 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 sanctioning the players um, or the first player um, that has a go at the line judge just to make sure that everyone knows that there is a line that will not be crossed. And that is uh, nobody is going to um, get a question um, the decisions of the officials in the match. Um, and then during the match, um, you then have um, uh, the rules which the first referee may um, may decide on the faults of. And and the, this list is is getting longer. I think it's now up to um, it might be ten, might even be more than that actually. Um, but um, so uh, and and you would do well to to just remember them. So you, you have the faults of the server and the uh, positions of the serving team, including the screen, if it ever occurs, of course. Um, the faults in playing the ball, which are the, the, the main ones, um, the faults above the net and the faulty contact of the player with the net primarily on the attacker side. So if 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 it's on the blocking side and it's right up close to you, then you can make that decision. Um, it's right in front of you, but primarily it's the attacking side and, and you should be looking at the whole of the whole of the net. So you need to be aware that you're you're responsible for the bottom edge of it as well as the top edge of it. Uh, it always used to be that the first referee was responsible only for the top of the net, um, and and it's becoming more often now that um, attackers um, can touch the bottom of the net either with their legs or um, on their way up um, to to attack the attack the ball. So remember that on the attacking side, the first referee has got all of the net to look at. So the second referee should not um, be um, uh, making decisions of net contact on the attacking side, uh, it doesn't look good. Um, you, the, the second referee has to focus on the the, the um, receiving team um, and that side of the net. Leave the leave the other side to the first referee. And first referee, that means you've got to be you've got to have that ability to have your eyes in two places because at the moment the for example the setter is setting the ball, you're looking at the ball contact. Um, but also you've got to look as to whether that setter is actually contacting the net at the time, particularly if the ball has come close to the net. So you, you might need to um, uh, take a view that um, if the ball is close to the net, that you'll actually look more at the net rather than the contact, uh, because you can always catch up with the with the contact um, a bit later. Um, obviously, um, you've got attack hit faults of the Libro and the back row players. Um, and remember that um, that the completed attack hit made by um, a player on the ball above the height of the net coming from an overhand finger pass by the Libro in his awful front zone is only the first referee that may call this fault. So even if, you, if you're a second referee, 
um, this is not a fault in your in your um, responsibility. So um, it's one for the first referee to determine and only the first referee to determine. So as we've talked before, we've talked about the Libro and making sure that it is um, an overhand finger pass. It's a controlled pass. Any other type of pass above the Libro's head is that, that doesn't appear to be in full control uh, doesn't fall foul of this particular rule. So it's the first referee that must um, be in control of this situation and make this call. Um, the second referee may not see all of all of the conditions in order to make this a fault. So first referees, please be aware. Um, and then also the ball crossing completely the lower space under the net, obviously remembering that the ball must completely cross the lower space under the net and can be played back if partially under the net. Um, and this is not a position where the player is um, guilty of playing the ball in the opponent's space. Um, under the net, if the ball is um, fully crossed the, the centre line, then that's when it becomes out. Uh, and until that point, it can be retrieved. Um, the completed block by a back row player or an attempted block by uh, the libero. So um, the most common one obviously is the setter, um, but you must remember that all of the conditions of the block must be um, adhered to in order for it to be a block. But remember that there is no intention in blocking. Um, so um, even though the rule says um, uh, attempting to intercept um, the ball coming from the opponent, um, it, it doesn't mean that the player has to be actually facing the opponent or um, actually intending to intercept the ball. It just means that the, the ball is either intercepted or uh, attempted to be intercepted. Um, the, the ball that crosses the net totally or partly outside the crossing space to the opponent's court or contacts the antenna on his or her side of the playing court. Now, just remember in this situation as first referees that the if this happens on the other side of the court, it is the second referee's duty. It's, it's within their responsibility and therefore this is one of those instances where you allow the second referee to the time to make the signal and to get in position to do so. Um, so therefore, if you see the antenna contacted, you may be able to give the second referee some help. For example, if, um, if you know that the ball has come from the block onto the antenna or it went straight from the attacker, you may be at this point be able to step in, able to give your second referee a bit of help and say, look, I know that it was it was block antenna um, or rather than um, attack hit antenna. But in general, it, leave this one to the second referee and let them make the decision. And then one that's been added, which is the serve ball or the third hit passing over outside the antenna on his or her side of the court. And this has been added to the second referee's responsibilities as well. Um, but normally if it's from a served ball, um, and it's going out, then the second referee will leave the decision up to the first referee. They're not likely to um, to call that one, but they can if they so wish. So just be aware that your second referee may call uh, a serve out if it goes over the um, over the post or outside the antenna on their side of the court. Um, and then at the end of the match, um, all you need to do is to um, check the score sheet and sign it. And obviously um, at the end of the match, one of the things that um, will happen is that teams will, will meet. Um, only, the, only the game captain is required to um, uh, say thank you to the, um, to the officials. So don't expect the entire team to do so. They don't need to, um, but you would expect the captain to come and say um, thanks very much, um, and the coach if, if if they're there, but they don't have to. So the, only the captain you would expect to see. And um, so, so don't get worked up if players um, just shake hands with, or with their with their counterpart and then ignore you as a referee. Um, it's not it's not a worry to, to have. Um, but also when you're checking the score sheet, obviously it's again a time when you can work as a team because you and the second referee can check it together. Um, particularly before you, you've got um, your signatures. So your scorer um, is going to check to make sure they're happy and they sign assistant scorer, then the scorer, uh, then the captains, um, then the second referee and then the first referee to finish it off. And if you've done all your pre-match checks, then properly, then um, checking the score sheet at the end of the match should be a breeze. It's just checking the scores and making sure they're sequential in each of the sets and making sure the right score is in the box and it all adds up correctly, which should be relatively straightforward. Uh, and we might and we will probably cover that when we talk about the scorer. But anyway, so 
the, the guidelines um, then begin to talk about um, working as a team um, and, and making sure that everything is going well as a team. Um, so the first referee must always cooperate with his or her uh, other members of the referee um, team um, and must let them work within their their uh, competence and their authority. OK, so um, at the end of a rally, um, whistle, the, at the end of a rally, you, you look at your other officials um, to see what decisions have been made or whether one of them is making a decision um, and, and uh, with the official hand signals and, and just um, give that opportunity to, to happen rather than um, rather than being appearing to be uh, refereeing without the, the, the help of the, the rest of the core. So, you know, when deciding ball in or out, if you have line judges, you know, look at the nearest line judge to the line to, to um, indicate, get their indication of whether the ball is um, uh, in in or out. Um, and, and it may be the case um, that you decide to um, not take their information. Um, they cannot insist on it. Um, first referee as and makes the final decision. So they, the, the, the other um, uh, the line judge or even the second referee cannot insist on the decision to the to the first referee, but you may give information. So um, be prepared if you're in that situation to help the first referee by giving information. And if you're first referee, make sure that you take the information which is proffered to you. Um, always make sure you look at the second referee. Um, and, and it's a good point to um, ensure that you are watching the second referee during interruptions and during breaks in play. Um, because you're looking at the benches as well. Um, things, uh, problems that occur tend to come from that side of the court towards the court. So if you see something coming, um, it's not a race between can you get to service authorization before, say, a late substitute appears in the substitution zone. If you see them coming, you've got a decision to make. Is it going to? Is it? Um, is it right that you wait for them? Um, if they're not, if they're taking their time, then don't wait for them. But if they're, if they're just coming in, it's not a case of let's try and get the service authorization first, just because they might be slightly late. Um, so just just be aware of what's going on the other side and help your second referee out on this one um, to, um, to to make sure that you don't get situations which make uh, make both of you look um, uh, look awkward, perhaps. OK, so what, what else do they talk about? They talk about um, uh, the first referee making the final decision with ball out with her, his or her hand signal. Um, you should always make sure that the second referee and the scorer have sufficient time to do their work. So don't move things on. For example, if your second referee is checking with the scorer or something, make sure you, you'll have seen it. You do your check. You know, it's not just a case of have both, both teams are ready and the server has the ball. Um, is your second referee ready? Is your scorer ready? Um, you have that look before you look at the teams. So look at your second referee. Are they are they actually ready for you um, to do the rest of your service authorization pro, um, routine? Um, and if they're not, wait for them. Just wait until they're ready. Um, and if things don't look right, don't put pressure on them to 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 speed to to do a check or something um, too quickly because that's when mistakes occur. Just make sure they're happy. And as second referees, don't rush things. Um, when you're in that situation, make sure the first referee has seen that you're stopping the match, the match is stopped, and then sort it out. Don't try and rush through those situations, just be clear about what's happened. And if you have to go to the first referee and tell them what's happened, then do so, make sure they're aware. And if you don't understand anything the first referee has done, then then obviously you would um, uh, you would expect the second referee to come and ask you as a first referee as to the player that you gave the warning to. I didn't, you know, which one was it? Did you give us... Do you give a sanction there or, or you know, just be clear as to what, what actually happens? Um, and then there are consequences of not working as a team uh, and when communication breaks down. So what, um, so what I was going to do is um, we're, that, that's all it, um, the, the, the um, guidelines and the um, uh, rules talk about the first referee, um, but there are some um, Facebook um, examples and I've tried to make sure that I've filtered out the casebook examples which specifically we've covered already in other uh, other rules so um, ones that actually talk about the things that we've talked about in terms of responsibilities and authorities so 
Um, Casebook 1.6 says, is the referee's decision final? May he, she change his or her own decision if the team protests? So <laughs> this has got this has really got two two parts to it, really. So the first one is the referee's decision final. But which referee? First referee, sorry. OK. No, because you can take in some other information. So your second referee could come over and say something to you. Yep, absolutely. And and you can and you can actually change your mind as you know, be, a set as a set is not finished. So, for example, if you find a fault that occurs that occurred, like normally it's about the wrong player being on the court or something, um, you can unravel the situation and go back to that point. Um, even if even if the set has technically finished, you can you can open it up again and go back. Um, so um, the referee's decision is not always final um, and, and referees that realise that um, they have completely misunderstood a situation um, are quite, quite within your rights to say, look, guys, I, I saw that differently. I understand that it was wrong and we're going to we're going to change my mind and I'm going to give a different decision or um, if it, if it's not a decision which you can change um, without because it, it's just is replay the point if you have to um, as long as the the consequences of your decision so if you stop the rally in midpoint to make a decision and then realize you made a mistake then you'd obviously you'd replay um, because because there's no um, following on um, playing action that determines the rally after the point at which you whistled but if you whistled right at the end of the rally then obviously there was a consequence either the ball is out it's been touched it's in yeah so you've got an alternative there but yeah so the referee can change their mind this is what this is getting to but you don't do it just because the team protests of course you do it because of the information that you're given by your refereeing core um, OK, so let's, this one 5.7 then. A, a team made an illegal Libro, illegal Libro replacement, but it was noticed before the service it was made. This is exactly the situation we've just seen. Um, OK, how should this be handled? So <laughs> who 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 wants to say how that last situation, tech, how the case book would have um, would have handled it? The correct player being put onto court and a team team delay warning given. Absolutely, it's as simple as that. And 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 if it was noticed after the service hit, then um, the team is obviously um, out of position. So it's the same as an illegal substitution. So you would um, uh, you you would stop the rally, or award the point to the opponent team, uh, correct the situation. Um, you don't you don't um, you don't award two points. Remember. So if the if you didn't if you found out at the end of the next rally and and the point had gone to the team that wasn't at fault um then you don't they don't get another point <laughs> they just get the one point um and, and you correct the situation and and and, you, and it's up to you whether at that point you would also might put, uh, do a delay if it then caused a further delay to the game um can a captain make a formal protest on the score sheet if he she, she has not notified the referee of his or her intention during the match so this is just clarifying in the case book that unless the protest is made at the point, then a protest cannot be made on the score sheet. OK, so it's it's just remembering that that we do not allow um, uh, captains and coaches to write things on the score sheet if they're just um, uh, a little bit un unhappy if there's no protest being made. And even if a protest has been made, then normally you would say, right, you di you dictate your protest to the scorer who will write it succinctly because the box is not that big um, you just need to put the basic facts and because a protest when a protest is made the first referee on the, on the court the first referee should indicate to the second referee clearly a protest has been made so that the scorer can record the point in the match at which it occurred okay so that you would have it either on a notepad um, uh, so that it could be written onto the score sheet later just write a little note to say at set to score bb uh, you know five five team b protested yeah and just put the basic facts down so that you know what the situation is going to be at the end of the match um at 7.5 then goes on to that point when i saying can a refereeing decision be reversed even after the end of the set um so the basic answer to that one is yes it can um and you just unravel 
to the to to um, to to so for example if you um, made a decision which ended the set and then realized that was wrong then you could um, then you could say no sorry teams stay on the court we go back change my mind it's going the other way um uh, if you if you have already started the next set, then you cannot go back. But but if you if you if you're still um, between uh, in the interruption, then you can um, then you can actually um, restart the set that's just theoretically ended. Um, I'm I'm struggling to see too many situations whereby you would do so, um, but that that could could occur. For example. Um, Let's say that situation there. If Germany had won this, uh, had, had won the set, and then the second, the 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 um, situation became clear between the sets that the wrong player was on the court for the last few points, then theoretically you can go back and correct it and finish the set properly. Doesn't look very good, but you could you could theoretically do it, and not. Not seen a situation whereby whereby that has happened though, but it can happen. Nick, that would be without a challenge, right? Uh, yes. That, only that officials verify things and then they realize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so if you get if you have a, a normal playing action um, and 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 you're in a challenge situation, then obviously the the final play is always challenged. You've seen it um, where challenge is used. And um, the last point of the set always always has a challenge on it. If the team's got one left that lost the rally, um, they'll challenge whatever they think is necessary to um, to to try and think they might win, whether it's ball in, ball out, net touch, block touch. They'll just try. Um, so um, the number of sets that you think, oh well, that set's finished okay, and then the teams have to stand on the court whilst the challenge is played out. Uh, and normally, I've never, I've not normally seen too many of those challenges actually succeed. They're normally last ditch efforts to try and hopefully see some fingertip that's got somewhere near a ball or something, which they, they, then there's not normally one of those that succeed. OK, so 711, um, has the first referee the right to whistle positional fault at the receiving team? I would say no, he's supposed to be looking at the serving team. Yep, absolutely. Anybody, anybody else on on this one? Technically, they could do, but it's not good practice because you're undermining your second referee. But I know I've had matches where I've seen a team's been out of position. Yeah. I let the first one go, but then I tend to call my second referee over and say, "By the way, you know, they're out of position," and they're still not blown it. And I've known. Minutes. It's got to the point after three of them not being blown, I've blown the whistle for it. <laughs> yeah, I must admit, I, I, I've been guilty of the same. Um, I, I've seen a team um, right at the, a team that's losing a set quite convincingly um, line up in, in, in error right towards the end of the set. Uh, and, and I've not authorised service and just told them to get in the right positions. Um, now, <laughs> You know, the the, uh, the the serving team then said to me, uh, ref, you're not supposed to you're not supposed to do that. And I said, yes, but you're you're eight points up with two points to win the set. So um, and the match, then um, let, let's, um, <laughs> you know, we'll just get on with it. It was it was obvious. Everyone knew it um, apart from the player that was clearly stood in the wrong place. So let's just move on. Um, but, but yes, so. Um, the reason I put that one in there is because we've actually got a, a, a video of it happening. Is it, 
so what what actually is um, what actually has happened here is the fact they've gone off for a, for a timeout. And they've come back on and they've just lined, they've just gone one rotation forward in their lineup um, as to where they were before the the, the timeout. Um, and obviously the, the setter um, should be backcourt in this situation. He should be at uh, five. I think it's this, um, uh, where are we, 15, 17. So what we've got on the on the screen, we've got fifth, the, the, the front row is the back row is 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 the libro five and one and one is the player stood next to the net okay so the the front row is 15 17 and eight and, and obviously clearly the setter should be behind number eight and not in front of them so it's, it's absolutely obvious and obviously when the ball is an overpass and the setter goes up to block again it's obvious that this is now an illegal you know the the, the reason the referee has gone for the gone for the positional fault is because um, it's an illegal back um, back row block, but obviously, clearly, the um, the setter shouldn't, you know, is is clearly in the wrong place if they're going to make if they if they're going to be um, uh, if they're going to make that um, that block. So um, therefore, the referee has gone with um, you're out of position because it's it's clearly what's happened first. Um, the setter cannot block the ball in that sit scenario by being close to the net. They should be back court, so therefore that's a fault. But the fact that they were right next to the net must be a fault, and it's not been seen by the second referee. So the first referee has tried to clarify by going, "Look, you're out of position. Number one must be behind number eight, and therefore it, it's a fault on on those things." So that's that's why um, um, uh, Laszlo Adler here, as first referee, has made that decision. Uh, he's trying to. He, he's, he's saying, "Well, I can't really give an illegal back row." Uh, block from a player that started the, the the rally right next to the net, um, because the the fact that they're next to the net means they're out of position, and that's why he's whistled it. That's my shot, Nick. The second referee appears to be looking at the serving team anyway in body position, whereas eyes are. Yeah, they're 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 on the right side. Um, yeah, and, and appears to be looking the other way. And and it may be that the second referee is actually confused. Because he's probably looking at it, going something's wrong. He's probably looking at the court, going, uh, "No, this doesn't. This this is wrong." But I don't know what it is, because the team is standing there, um, going, "Look, you know, we're we're quite happy. You know, we're, this is a, a we're we're in a, a position which we could be in to receive. If, for example, the front row was, if they were one, if they were one rotation forward on reception, then it would have been one eight fifteen front row. Uh, is that is that right?" No, it would have been one eight seventeen, wouldn't it? No, one one seventeen five. Are we sure? No, that no. If they're one position forward, they would have had. Um, no, uh, fifteen would then be in position one, so so seventeen would have been at two. Yeah, yeah. So had so eight and one. Yeah, so so if they were one position up, then then that situation fifteen as would have to be behind. 17. 17 and they're in front of 17 so they're out of position there anyway they're even wrong. if they they're were one they if they were one or <laughs> one four so um so they're wrong <laughs> so so it's um so i think they're, they're just trying to clarify that, that you, you you're completely wrong here and and the other team know it the other team know they're completely out because um you know the directing players they know who, who's in front of them and they know that clearly the setter shouldn't be where they are so anyway but that's the situation where it's occurred um, and and uh, I think, um, as I say, um, uh, Laszlo there has tried to clarify his situation by calling that um, and showing it. And then, then there are a couple of longer casebook um, ones which are um, around um, communication. Um, so so this one is one, and I've tried to split it up so that it's in sort of sequential um, uh, uh, things. So the coach should be requested a timeout. The second referee whistles. The first referee doesn't hear the second referee's whistle and authorizes service. The second referee whistles again to allow the requested timeout. Amid some confusion, the first referee awards a delay warning to B. Later in the same set, a server of B was sanctioned for delaying the game. The second delay sanction for B in the same match resulted in a delay penalty and gave point gave A a point. 
This was point 24 and took A to match point, which they subsequently won. Team B vehemently protested against the delay sanctions. Were they justified in their protest? Yes. So when should they have protested? That's the point when the delay warning was given. I think that before, when 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 the situation about the, the first referee not le not hearing the whistle, they should have established at that point. Okay, no, hold on a minute. There was a request. You didn't hear it, but it was. So hmm, the the first referee then should have granted that, or at least established the facts and yeah. Go like that. This is a situation where the second referee should have just said, look. I did whistle. I was before you. We need to stop. We need to allow the time out. Um, and we just need to go. Uh, you didn't hear it um, and sort it out. Uh, and but the first referee has compounded the situation by ignoring the second referee. So they should have just sort of stopped and, and the second referee should have just gone. Look, I'm going to come over to, to tell you if, if, I, if you don't understand me through the microphone, if there were microphone or if they weren't on the microphone. Go over to the first referee and say, look, I did whistle. I was clear. You clearly didn't hear. It. It's a misunderstanding between us. Therefore, the timeout was called in good time uh, and therefore it's a timeout and therefore stop the first situation happening com uh, uh, completely. And you're absolutely right. That's the point at which uh, the team should have um, should have protested, um, not later in the set when things got um, and went against them. The other thing that's not happened there is the first referee obviously didn't see the second referee signalling for the timeout either. Absolutely. So this is this whole point about the about the first referee looking at the second referee, because normally if if a, if a, you know what you, we're all relatively experienced to know when a coach should be calling a timeout. Um, so you you're standing there and you, and you're just going, coach, come on, you know, are you going to call at this point or are we going to wait till next point to do it? You know, you you get that feeling as to when it's going to happen. And therefore, um, when you know, um, uh, you, you just need to. Um, uh, you just need to wait and just let it play out. And if that means you have to give a little bit of extra time between the rallies as first referee, just to see that if it, is it going to happen? No, it's not going to happen. Right. Let's get on with it. Yeah. And then and then move on. So first referee, this is the point at which you're looking at the coach going, I know there's a timeout coming. Just wait, wait for it. Let it let it play out. And if that means you have to give them a few more seconds, give them a few more seconds to find out either way. Nick, in these matches, was there not the buzzer that the press normally? Uh, yeah, probably. There probably was. Yeah. So clearly either that didn't happen um, or there or, or it wasn't used or something. So there must have been something else which made it meant that um, uh, that that things didn't um, weren't noticed as to what was going on. But even even if you even if you got a buzzer and it hasn't been used, you know, the, as first referee, you can see what's going on. You can clearly see when a coach is going to call. I think you can anyway, when a coach is going to call a timeout or expecting to call a timeout. Um, and, you know, from the from a, a number of points or if they get frustrated with the team in a rally or whatever, you know something's going to happen. So it's just that moment when you perhaps have to use that information just to go, well, I'll just give it a few more minutes, a few, not minutes, seconds, a few more seconds just to see what's yeah. happening. And you should be doing your sweep anyway, which you would then see that. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, clearly the first referee was not was not doing that. So th here's another one. Um, so this is a, this is around the scoreboard. Um, this is saying during the second set, the scoreboard could be seen by the spectators as, as not correct. Immediately, the emotional coach of A, as so often they are, challenged the score of the referee and the control committee and was supported by his head of delegation. Um, the first referee whistled the game captain of A and explained that he was sanctioning the coach with a penalty for rude conduct, which is the correct um, uh, sanction for a coach approaching um, the game jury or control committee member during a match. Um, although the game captain had to communicate to his coach, he, he did not do so. Furthermore, in the resulting confusion, the second referee missed the sanctioning of the coach and the penalty for rude conduct was not recorded on the score sheet. The score was corrected and the game continued without any mention of the incident recorded on the score sheet. How should the incident have been handled? Well, where do you start? 
<laughs> the, the the first point is that if there's a challenge to the score, um, is the the second referee and the scorer deal with the situation, um, and the first referee allows them to do so. Um, now all the, all the team needed to do was to was to say to the second referee or say to the scorer, they don't have to approach them or look at them, and they have to just go, you know, just point that the score is wrong. You know, you, you get a sense when things are wrong. Um, I did a match um, with um, uh, Susanna um, in uh, 2016 where um, the scorer accidentally added a point. Um, I don't know how, but they did. Um, at the beginning of a set, and we didn't see it, um, but the teams, um, what the teams noticed because their stats guys knew the score was wrong. Um, and in that situation, you know something's wrong. You can feel it. You know pe people start pointing and gesturing around the court, um, and 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 you just have to stop and go right. Okay, you know I was first referee. Susanna was second. So Susanna, please sort it out. Which she did. Um, and then you move on and, 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 you, and you nip it in the bud. And, and, and if it's in the MDL and you've got a, a flip score, sheet, all you need to go is to the scorer and say to the scorer, um, let's just check, are, is the score correct? And if you can't determine from the, what's going on that the score is incorrect, you have to say to the two coaches, as far as I can see, the score is correct. Let's move on, even if they think it's wrong. So in that situation here, um, again, a bit of a breakdown in communication. Again, uh, all the, you know, instead of they, they should have sorted out the, the scoreboard, the scorer was maybe inattentive, the scoreboard operator was maybe inattentive, uh, and all it needed was for, uh, for everyone to just calm everything down, say to the player, you go back there, we'll sort the score out and we'll move on without anything else um, happening. Now, the fact that um, the second referee missed the sanctioning of the coach, um, this is this is a, a, a one whereby if the first referee had told game captain of a ex, to, the coach had to acknowledge the card then the, the first referee would have waited until the coach had acknowledged the card and at that point would have it would have been clear to everyone what was going on because there would have been a break until this happened so the the, the, the first referee was was a um was at fault for just issuing a card with nobody acknowledging it um, and then also not realising that the second referee and the score hadn't seen it. So um, a lot of things went went on there that um, that, that sh shouldn't have done, but it was down again to looking at each other and communicating. Mika, that means also that the point wasn't given to, to the opponents. It wasn't given, yeah, absolutely, it wasn't given. Yeah, um, I think this is the, uh, the last one. Um, so uh, player number one was ready to serve. His game captain requested confirmation of the correct server. The scorer gave the information that player number six should be the server. The game captain doubted the information and insisted that player number one should be the server. Still not satisfied and while attempting to approach him, the first referee whistled for service. Amidst confusion, the team was penalised for not serving within the allowed eight seconds. In the score sheet, it was found that the coach of the team had submitted an incorrect lineup, which had two number sixes in, on, in two positions, when it should have been six and one. Number one should have been serving as the game captain had correctly surmised. What is the correct ruling by the first referee? Anybody want to anyone want to dive in on this one? Well, I'll dive in because I usually get things wrong. So if there are two number sixes and it wasn't picked up, it's not the second referee's fault. So it should have been picked up the, the um, coach put the wrong lineup in, so they lose the points, and it goes. The service goes to the opposition. Uh, hey, can I say yeah. something? Yep, yeah, certainly. Yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, I know that the lineup sheet might be have been given to the score to the scorer, but when, then the second referee, when was uh, checking the lineup before the start of the set, should have noticed it. Usually, what I do is I get it. Uh, before the scorer, and then if there is a mistake, I ask the coach hmm? just to make sure because sometimes the scorers they write whatever they are given. Hmm? So I just check that there are no repeated numbers. Uh, yeah, and I think I think you're absolutely right, Herm. And I think in this situation, um, the 
second referee should have intercepted the lineup sheets and not allowed them to be given directly to the scorer. Or even after the scorer has recorded them, you've got both of them in your hand because you're going to check the lineups on the on the court anyway. Um, but you would always check them. And, and one thing that I do, even even if it's absolutely clear, if, if a number is not written correctly or has been overwritten or whatever, I always go to the coach and say, coach, just confirm what is this number so that I'm absolutely clear. And then I confirm to the scorer, this is the number that is written here. Um, and But if you've got two number sixes on the lineup sheet, the, the, the first, the second referee hasn't spotted it. The scorer hasn't checked the lineup sheet against the team roster, which they should be doing at the start of the set. They've then written it down twice, which surely they would have gone, well, hang on, I've already got a six. Um, and, <laughs> and then they would have found it. But and then the second referee should have then, if that didn't find it at that point, when they checked the players on the court, they would have gone, I've got two number sixes. So there's there's a lot of things which are, which are falling down in process here um, that, that could have um, stopped this. But also in this situation, the first referee is not looking because the first referee has whistled for service when clearly one of the teams is not ready. And they're not ready because the captain is is trying to find out who his server is. So um, and therefore, if they've got the wrong ser server, then how could the server have the ball? So in this situation, every, everything seems to have broken down in terms of the communication between the, the first referee, the second referee and the scorer. Um, what's going on on the court, the process? So. Um, yeah, not not great. So let's hope that um, that doesn't happen in any NVL matches because I know we're better than that. So Nick, I presume this is on the first rotation round of the players, then, isn't it? When it, the players come up to do it wrong. Yeah. Conversely, yeah. Nick, you could argue on this one that the first referee was to blame because when they were checking the teams when they were warming up, wearing their numbered shirts, <coughs> they should have spotted it then. Yeah, so but. Well, well, no, 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 it's an administration reason. error. He'd written it down on the uh, lineup sheet incorrectly. There was a six and a one. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's an happening error. Two sixes. No, oh, two sorry, sixes yeah. on the, yeah, on the that, lineup yeah. sheet rather on than on the court. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, lo lots of things um, not working out there. So that's, um, you know, and I think that, the, yeah, that was the last one. So the, the point I've been trying to make here is with the first referees is that you've got communication even though you're on the stand there's lots of ways in which you can you can support communication and and also that um, and accept communication um and and should do so um from from the, the the core there are times when you just have to be firm um and 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 make a decision and move on but um but clearly some of these situations are very um, uh happen and and it's sometimes normally down to the fact that maybe somewhere the communication could have been better that's all I um, all I wanted to, um, to to talk about about the first referee. Um, uh, uh, we've got um, we've got the second referee and the scorer to 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 come. Um, so um, I just wanted to say, as as always, thank you very much for your time and for your your input. It's 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 really good to have these discussions. Um, and if you if there's anything that you want to um, what want us to cover um, as we're getting, we're almost got to the end of the end of the rule book now. Um, the only bits we didn't do were all the um, were all the um, statistical bits at the beginning, like the width of lines and the um, shirt numbers and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I'm not sure that, um, that, that that well, I might I might do a, se a session on that, but it will be extraordinarily dry. Um, so, so I hope it's not been too um, uh, uh, it's it's not been too much uh, written stuff. Um, I tried to find. Um, so it's some video, but it's not without going back over stuff. It's it's not e it's not easy to do for the for this one. Um, and then you could start challenging every single little little piece of the process. But um, thanks very much for your time. As always, it's been it's been good. Just got to um, aside from what we've listened to tonight. And hello, everyone. Uh, <laughs> it might be one for die this, but do you think it might be with the beach circuit kicking off or, or well in advance now having a. a session for beach referees yeah. well over, I was over, over to you Di 
<laughs> well, I suggest, Brendan, we should all be reading our b- rule books all the time at breakfast and at lunch and things like that. <laughs> so we should know all the rules. Breakfast. And, breakfast. Yeah. breakfast. <laughs> yeah. like my and the other What's thing is, them? Brendan, there is, I think, Nick, um, on the rules of the game, on, you know, where we go to, to, to do the questions, I think yeah. there is the beach volleyball on there, isn't there? I'm hoping that they've been updated because you know, Brendan, I'm not in charge of Beach, it's Deb. But um, I think there is some questions on there that you can do as well to do it. But I understand yeah. where you're coming from. I, I, I will. I've refused to re- referee on the beach this year because I can't put the rules into my head. Yeah, but, it's, it's difficult when you've had 18 months off, really, isn't it? You know, yeah. Uh... yeah um... anyway, you just blag it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's difficult to blag it and pool in a fortnight's time. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when money's involved. Whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. um, I spent yeah. the last 40 years blagging it, so I'll manage a little bit longer. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I am um, I am planning to do um, to, to try and get a, a beach session. Um, that, that's a good point, Brendan, absolutely. And well rem- reminded me that I've been a bit lax in um, where are we getting to June without having sorted that out. So thanks very much for the reminder. Nick. Yeah. You said that we didn't cover uh, lines and all that. Um, I'm not a football follower, but I heard that during the Euros, uh, a goal had to be moved or changed. And I thought, this is amazing. This is uh, something that is done before the competition starts. And I don't know if if you heard the same thing. Uh, So it's, it's kind of weird. Mm, that they would that they started a match late because of uh, an error like that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, to to uh, get that far into it with that and then have to do it. Um, uh, when um, when I was lucky enough to do the 2016 Olympic qualification um, tournament in Puerto Rico, um, we uh, spent three days trying to get the court manager to relay one of the courts. I think it was court A because the attack line was was one meter, was was a whole a meter, meter <laughs> was a whole meter out, <laughs> and, <laughs> and he, <laughs> he well. absolutely refused. And we we said, look, this is just not happening. Uh, you know, every day we went into the sports hall and went, it's not been moved. And in the end, we just went and we we just tore up the court and relay and did the whole thing again. But, Send you uh, to spec savers. Yeah, absolutely. But he was saying he was saying absolutely it was correct, and he wasn't changing it for for anybody. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it was. But you know, funny things do happen sometimes, and you just look at them and go, "Well, that's so far out. Surely, so surely somebody's going to sort that out." And then to, to come back day after day and find that nothing's happened, and you go. I remember, I remember traveling from Liverpool to Newquay to referee a beach tournament once, and when we got there, we had to cancel the beach tournament because the courts went up to scratch. <laughs> it was, the local council had let them down. They, they'd been um, the ones responsible for getting everything ready. And when we turned up there on the Friday evening, it was a shambles. And there was a World Championship um, windsurfing competition on at the same time. And I think that got all the priority, I think. So Liverpool to New Key and <laughs> been out of the being blown. That's a, that's a trip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. OK, well, thank, thank you very much, everyone, for your, for your time. Thank you. It's been fantastic. And um, uh, I really appreciate the, the effort you put into to be part of these. So thanks very much.